my desire is to have direct primary care transform our healthcare system so it can function the way it is designed for particularly for patient care mm -hmm. uh, to be delivered in a way that's compassionate, that is high quality, that's cost effective, uh, and it aligns incentives for employers, patients, and doctors. Hey, what's up, guys? Spencer Smith here, host of the Self-Funded with Spencer podcast, sponsored by Pareto Health, ClaimDoc, and PlanSite. Enjoy today's episode. Shivering. I want to shiver for two minutes. Are you consistent about doing it on a Every daily day. basis? This morning I did it. Okay, because I, 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 I try 30 seconds, and I, I can get myself to do it maybe once or twice a month, and it's just, it's, I don't know what it is about the cold not every, shock. Not everybody yeah. can do it. Not but I mean, I want to do it. I, I actually genuinely believe in the positive effects of it. Oh, yeah. It's the discomfort that I have to get over, like, psychologically to uh -huh. go ahead and make myself do well, it. Well, I, I, I go to about here first. Oh, so, so you kind of slowly I, I, turn then, the dial? So then I get, so I go from, I go from hot, so I go from, and I'm not a sauna person, because I do, there's benefits with going with heat. Um, so it's really the adversity. You're trying to get your body shocked. And in, in, so that's why exercise, that's why mm -hmm. fasting is helpful. Cold, either warm or cold, they all turn on your adversity genes. Okay. Uh, and uh, and that those... I've never heard that term before, adversity genes. Yeah. So, so there's like mTOR, there's mm -hmm. the sirtuin genes, and then there's the AMPK genes. Okay. Uh, and they, But they are called, is that is that the common terminology is an adversity gene? David Sinclair okay. would say that, he, I mean, he's coined all of this stuff. Okay. He's the... He's the Harvard PhD guy that does all of the studies, um, and and so he would say those three would be the the adversity genes. He calls them horror. He's got he's got another name that he calls them, but but I I can remember yeah. adversity genes. And so when we have certain short term periods of adversity, mm -hmm. um, obviously long term stress is not good for us, but short term stress positive it helps, stress almost right it yeah. helps to get our bodies hunkered down mm -hmm. and into repair mode and so when you know you know we're when you're exposed to sunlight and you get sun damage mm -hmm. or something like that it's like okay hey we need to repair and we got to make sure that we don't have our cells go haywire yeah. so that's kind of what they do well you do you know uh mark testa who's with oh, Regenix. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Mark Testa. I'm going to see him. I just saw him inside. I'm going to see him when I go back up He actually up there. had me on his podcast at Ascend last year. Did he the, really? Were you at Ascend? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. So yeah. he had he brought a camera with him. And so he was like, hey, come on over here. Let's do like a two-minute, yeah. you know, just banter back and forth. And, That's cool. Uh -huh. I didn't know. He, I actually didn't know he did that. Um, I had Mark down, and we did two episodes with him. We did uh -huh. one ed episode dedicated to Regenex and, yeah. and the stem, their stem yeah. cells. And then the other one was uh, we dedicated an episode to fasting. So Mark Good. and I okay. talk fasting all the time. He's an avid faster. We'll do extended five-day fasts and yeah. fasting mimicking diets and all those things. And so we talked about all these things. He does red light therapy. We talk about autophagy, right? Yes, so that, autophagy, that's, that's got yeah. me on the subject of, of uh -huh. what you were talking and about. And senescent cells and all that yeah. fun stuff. Zom yeah. Get rid of the zombie cells. Yeah. I'm, I'm literally <laughs> just a... Um, <laughs> Uh, consumer of this information. You yeah. know, I obviously am not trained. I do have an exercise science degree, but I have a, do you really? an interest oh, okay. in, in this stuff. Um, from a longevity, from a quality of life, from seeing my parents not do a great job of taking care of their health and at a young age becoming aware that I had responsibility to take care of my own health. And yeah. just it became an area of interest, right? Um, but I like very basic, simple things that someone can fall. I don't get yeah. into deep theory. It's like there's evidence for ketogenic diets or low carbohydrate. There's evidence for uh, periodic fasting or intermittent fasting. Yeah. The simpler, the better, because for me, it's about adherence. It's about being able to build it into a lifestyle. Yeah. And so that, like, I, I just want to find what are the things that have the most obvious, at least the highest likelihood of a positive outcome. Yeah. I'll follow those, right? And yeah. keep, keep them simple. Um, well, I always, like with patients, I always say, hey, what are your goals? Like, what are your values and your goals? And a lot of times I'll say, okay, and, and if longevity is a goal, one of the things I'll say is, okay, what do you want to do when you're 80 years old? Mm -hmm. And just like you're going to train, like a person who's doing a marathon might train mm -hmm. for the marathon and plan how they're going to perform, 
I'm like, okay, think of your life as preparing to be that 80 year old. Do yeah. you want to be able to ski? Do you want to golf? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be able to travel? Do you want to be able to pick up your grandkids? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of things do you want to do? And let's prepare. You're going to have some decrease in VO2 max, some decrease in your muscle mass uh, over time. But if we can be able to get it at a higher level, we can anticipate where you're going to be and let's get you there. Yeah. Well, that's where Peter Atia, I think you and that's I are both Peter aligned. Atia. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've absolutely dedicated, um, you know, I was a soccer player through, uh, you know, mid twenties almost. Um, and so very intensive cardiovascular exercise, but I always had an interest in weight training. Now I'm very much heavy on the weight training as I age, because my, my goal, right. Is to stave off sarcopenia to yep. osteoporosis, you know, making sure that just the infrastructure, uh, of my body can, uh, weather the test of time and, yeah. and aging. And, um, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about those things, uh, thinking about what is it going to be like to be a grandfather, hopefully, and yeah. be one that can still run around with the grandkids. That, that's the hope, right? right. Um, anyway, so I think you and I might have another podcast <laughs> in this, but let's, let's focus uh, on what we're going to do today and let's go ahead and start. Uh, I got the green light from Nathaniel. So I'm here with Dr. David Cameron, who is a CMO of Hint Health, among other things, but that's the reason we're here today. So thanks for coming in. And why don't you, if you don't mind, give me just a two second uh, a briefing on DPC, which is what we're going to cover. And then we'll get your backstory after that. Great. Uh, Spencer, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, I am the chief medical officer at Hint Connect. Uh, it's um, an organization where we're trying to build a network of direct primary care. And what direct primary care is, instead of fee-for-service primary care, it is a membership base. Uh, okay. And so the fee structure is different. So either the patient or the employer is paying a monthly fee for a set number of primary care services. And you can think of it kind of like, almost like a gym membership. You pay a monthly fee mm -hmm. for your gym membership and you can go as much as you want. It's unlimited. Okay. And with the primary care, you're able to do uh, primary care, urgent care, all the chronic disease management. But we also promise the same day, next day appointments, the coordination of care to specialty and hospital mm -hmm. care. But we also keep our cell phones on 24 seven so our patients can get a hold of us anytime. Yeah. I, right now they can call me and I'll probably ignore them for the- <laughs> I'm in a podcast, hold on, I'll get back to you about that, that uh, hurt ankle, right? Uh -huh. um, but one, I think I told you over coffee, I am a, I'm a believer in DPC. Uh, as soon as it was introduced to me and I started investigating, I go, that makes a lot of sense. And we'll unpack why I believe that and obviously why you've dedicated your, your career to that mission as well. The other thing I will say though, and don't let me forget this. I want to I want to separate DPC from an HMO model and capitation because I, I think there's some obvious downsides to that. And I, I forgot to ask you that over coffee. So I want to go ahead and plant that seed in your mind for okay. later. Um, but before we go fully down the path, and we're going to spend a lot of time in this, I want to kind of get your backstory, sure. uh, your why, right? Why you're here, all those things. So could you give us a brief uh, bio, what you want to share that's led you up to, to, to here today? Pareto Health is the manager of the largest employee benefits group captive in the United States. And it's also now the main sponsor of the Self Funded with Spencer podcast. I chose to partner with Pareto Health for three main reasons. Number one, their dedication to improving the world of health benefits. Number two, their mission to reduce volatility and to make self-funding simple for mid-sized employers. And number three, the strength and scale of their program. With over 2,300 member groups and more than $1 billion of stop loss premium under management, Pareto Health is the most robust solution of its kind in the country, period. Stay tuned for more information because I'm sure I'll be featuring them on an episode of the podcast very soon. Visit Pareto Health at ParetoHealth.com or follow them on LinkedIn to stay up to date on the latest news and developments. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a family physician. Uh, I trained uh, at the University of Washington for medical school, and then I did my family medicine practice, uh, our family medicine residency in Tacoma, and I practiced there for 10 years uh, in fee-for-service. Okay. And one of the things with uh, fee-for-service is that in order to, to survive, and also for the organization that's employing us primary care doctors, is that you need to see a number of patients in order to make things work financially. And so I had 2,500 patients. Uh, I had about 10 to 12 minutes per patient. Okay. Uh, and they trained me that in order to be able to see the number of patients per day, you need to ask the patient at the beginning, what one or two problems do you want to talk about today? Mm. If there's more than that, if you've got a big list, you're going to have to schedule a series of appointments to okay. make that happen. And so 
I would see patients from eight to five, and then I'd have about two hours of paperwork after that. And I felt like I was not able to give the type of care that I would want my family to get. Yeah. And that was really hard from a professional satisfaction standpoint. Well, and that's something I think we commonly hear from primary care physicians these days is a lot of it is there's burnout from the quality of life and wasn't exactly what the physician hoped to to get out of a meaningful career being overworked. I mean, you said 2,500 patients in a panel with 10 to 12 minutes per patient. Okay. And that, that one to two questions, like, is he almost like making the patient prepare ahead of time? Give me the key stuff. And hopefully we'll get to the other stuff five months from now or three months from now when I can see you next. And so how did that sort of from an emotional level and philosophical level, how did that impact what you thought you were going to be doing versus what reality actually was? When I was in medical school, I had a very different uh, concept of what I thought I would be doing. I thought I would be more like the small town 1950s doc Mm -hmm. that had relationships with patients and would almost see them as friends or family. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I felt like patients were more adversaries. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I would have a patient that would come in and if I knew that they had a lot of problems or if I knew that they would take a lot of time, I would go, oh, this is going to be a really, it's going to first going to be a very rushed visit and I'm going to try and get done as soon as possible. But the other thing is it's going to put me behind for for the rest rest of the day. day. Yeah. Uh, And so there was dread. I would have Mm -hmm. dread in my day and I didn't like the fact that the more complicated patients or patients that needed more time, maybe they might be hard of hearing, maybe they didn't speak English. So from a standpoint of doing what I felt was right, and I really enjoyed uh, taking care of people that were more complicated and uh, taking care of people that had uh, particular needs that might need more time, but I felt like the system was set up in a way Mm -hmm. that I could not do that justice. What, so let's get into the system a little bit. And then I, I know we have a lot more to go in your career and I'll ask you some more questions about the progression, but the system itself, how do we get into this predicament where everything is so rushed, the quality of care is diminished because of the time that's allotted and there's this pressure uh, yeah. to funnel uh, people through your office? How, how did we get there? Well, I think it's set up in a way that is... It was prob- well, it's not set up by doctors. It wasn't set up by employers, not set up by patients, but it was set up by systems to, to, to get patients through. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's really just a, th- a throughput in order to make sure that the, the, the system can get volumes of patients through and claims get paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in my mind, I, I think that system is not good for doctors, good, not good for patients, not good for employers. And so I made the hard choice to say, I want to do something outside of the system. Was the pressure coming from the ownership of that system or is it also coming from the insurance side of the equation or both of them adding to that pressure? I I would say both. Both. Okay. I would say both. And and I'm not in that, uh, I'm not in that arena. And so I don't want to make assumptions. Sure. Sure. Uh, But from my perspective, when you're employed by a hospital system, there are there are certain things that are put on the physicians, and we're we're forced to practice a certain way, yeah, uh, in order to make the economics make sense. Primary care, unfortunately, the reimbursement's very low. And so for the hospital system to be profitable, and many are not profitable, um, they will need to have a large volume of patients going through. And many of them are subsidized by specialty uh, services, which are more highly reimbursed. So more procedural based um, specialty like cardiology, uh, orthopedic surgery. So they would like to capture those referrals within the system. Uh, and so that way they can make primary care make more sense financially. Yeah, make up for the lost revenue, right? Mm-hmm. Well, so you mentioned, as we were chatting earlier, the devaluing of primary care. So it's not only being devalued from uh, the perception of what's being delivered from a quality perspective, but it's actually being devalued in the reimbursement rates as well. True. Okay, yeah. okay. So that's how we get That's how we get here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're dealing with this physician burnout. When did you reach your precipice and go, uh, we, we like to call it the damn it moment at yeah. Pareto where an employer yeah. say, damn it, I can't take this anymore. When when was your moment for you personally? So mine was 12 years ago. At that point, I I knew that I could not continue to do this for the duration of my career. I'd have to do something else. I, I heard about direct primary care at a talk. It was 2011. I heard a talk. It was in our county medical society. Garrison Bliss, who's one of the founders of direct primary care, gave a talk. And immediately I knew like, 
I don't know what I need to do, but I want to do that. Yeah. That's yeah. what I want to do. Six months later, I started um, chatting with Davida, and they were interested in starting up a, a direct primary care system for all of their employees across the country. Okay. And I said, well... Let's talk about that. Yeah. And so I joined up with five other uh, business folk uh, at DeVita, and we built the first uh, direct primary care clinic in Tacoma, Washington. And there was the financial headquarters uh, just down the street. And so we built it there right right near, and, and we set it up so that we could take care of all of their employees and their dependents. DeVita had a self-funded plan, mm -hmm. but they were... Uh, having difficulty with their spend. And they said, if we can capture all of our patients and have them go primarily to direct primary care, is there a way that we can be able to decrease the uncontrolled spend downstream? Right, right. And so we did. So we built that. And not everybody joined. We probably got 60% of people that joined uh, What the was plan. the size of their employee population? Uh, they had 1,100. Okay. Uh, right right there. And I think I, day one, I think I had 650 patients. Uh, and, and we took care of, and some of them, uh, you know, continued on with their fee for service primary care, which was fine. They got the option. Mm -hmm. Uh, but those patients, they would come and they would, uh, see me for all of their healthcare needs. Uh, and that was including primary care. There's, uh, you know, if they have diabetes, high blood pressure, if they needed procedures, lumps and bumps, freeze warts, all of that stuff. Took care of the pediatrics, do the wellness exams. We drew oh, blood wow. in the clinic, uh, sent people just down the street to get x-rays uh, at the most cost-effective places. And we mm -hmm. had our referral networks to uh, refer to the orthopedic surgeons that had their own ambulatory surgical center. Yep. So we could really help. And I knew their benefit plan inside and out. So I could tell them, I said, hey, your deductible is this. This is going to be your co-insurance if you go outside of here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'd give them options. I'd say, hey, where would you like to go? There's five different places where you can get your MRI. If I send you to this one place, it's 400. If I send you to this other place, it's 3,000. And they said, well, maybe I'll go to the one that's 400. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, care coordination. It was, all, it was kind of what you were doing. But I mean, I, that obviously is a unique model. That's more of almost a nearsight uh, model, right? Because it was just their population of employees. So you could have that level of intimacy with the plan. And yeah. I mean, I, I was telling you earlier, you, you almost effectively act as a consultant for them, not guiding or steering them. You have to go here. You have to go here. You say, here are your options right. based on the options you have. Here are your choices, which choice seems like the smarter choice. And then you let them, let them make that choice. Yeah. I feel like I'm their consultant. Yeah. I, I, th I think patients are smart. And if I present them a bunch of choices that could get them into the, to the same place, and I can talk about the pros and the cons of mm -hmm. each of the different options, uh, I have a feeling that patients are good at arriving at what meets their values. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I like to respect pa patients' goals and their values. And and it might be different from patient to patient. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think that they can make some very good decisions if you have the time to be able to have those discussions. Yeah. Well, and before we go into really the solution, one of the problems I think we talked about over coffee was that in that fee-for-service model, the ratio of physicians to the administrative staff that yeah. was typically required versus what DPC requires. So can you talk to me about that ratio and why there's so much more admin staff in that model? Sure. Yeah. No, in, in our practice, we'd have uh, a receptionist. We'd have a medical assistant. We also have a nurse. We'd have uh, a receptionist referral coordinator. We had someone that had to do billing. We also had uh, care management. We actually had some mental health. We had a ridiculously high ratio of, of one doctor or provider to seven staff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just, so that, one just, doctor to seven staff. That, that, was how, that was how we needed to, to function in order to get all of, those, all of those things done and also to be able to manage that large of a patient panel. Yeah. And in my practice, so I'm no longer uh, in a, um, in a with DeVita, with Paladina Health, I'm in my own private practice. Mm -hmm. And we've got four doctors uh, in our practice and three medical assistants. Okay. And so the ratio, we just don't have that same need for uh, all of those different roles because uh, we have a much smaller patient panel. We have about four to 600 
uh, patients per doctor. Uh, we don't have a biller because yeah. we don't bill. There's no insurance. There's right? no insurance. Yeah, that's 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 a big thing. I want to make sure we stress that point. It is taking it away from the insurance reimbursement model altogether, yeah. right? So this is a monthly fee right. based on what is it? Is it different prices for if it's an employee only or family? Different price points for that. Yeah, correct? And, yeah. and adults are typically with uh, with a network of direct primary care. On average, it's around seventy five to eighty five dollars for adults and about $40 to $50 per month for kids. Okay, okay. But then as a, a consumer, right, I would have to wrap my head around paying this additional fee. So one of the right. things we were talking about how we can get this sort of to scale is that the employers are, are right. covering that cost. So, and so we'll talk about, you know, who's the, the you know, ideal candidate and things like that in a moment. But let's shift into gears. Like let's shift yeah. into, we've left fee-for-service behind. We've done this DeVita model, right? Yeah. And so before we go on to when you were in your own practice, what did you experience, right, from a quality of outcomes? What did you see from their population, the ROI, all those things? Let's dig into a little bit of that actual experience itself. Exactly. Yeah. So I think of the triple aim as being cost, quality, and customer satisfaction. So if we take a look at, uh, at quality, we can look at HEDIS measures, uh, standard benchmarks across the United States. And um, with direct primary care, we consistently were in the 90th percentile. And it's very easy to see. Let me just give you an example. Mm -hmm. So you know, I saw a patient one time. He came in for headaches as a new patient. Okay. Um, his blood pressure was 170 over 110, okay. so dangerously mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a, a person that was overweight. He was drinking a little too much. Uh, he also um, was also drinking a lot of soda. Ah. Uh, and so uh, first off, I said, we need to get you into a safer position. It was a safer place. It's too high, and you're at risk for heart attack and stroke. And so we had to get him on some blood pressure medicines, check an EKG, do some blood work, do a full mm -hmm. physical exam. But the thing I said is, what, what are your goals? Mm -hmm. how, how do you want to approach this? What are the things that have worked for you in the past? What things have you have not worked? What are the things that you are interested in trying? What are the things that you're not interested in trying? And where would you like to go? And so I, I could put together a plan for him but that may not be followed through. We found time and time again, patients are not necessarily very good at adhering to doctor created plans, but if they create it and we support, they ah, are much more successful if you use motivational interviewing. And so I just asked them the, the standard motivational interviewing questions, which takes time. I could never do this in my favorite mm -hmm. service practice. So we said, well, I'd like to cut out, cut out soda and I think I can cut down on my alcohol and I want to start exercising a little bit. So just a couple things he mm -hmm. wanted to change. Mm -hmm. He dropped 50 pounds over six months yeah. making those small changes. Yeah. So we dropped him. He, he got off one of his blood pressure medicines and was down to just a half of the other one. Uh, he was feeling much better. His energy level was significantly better. And he was so proud of himself, too, mm -hmm. for making those changes. And the things that make this such a highly attractive um, model for patients is that they are much more successful. We found that their chronic diseases are twice as likely to be under good control with direct primary care compared to fee-for-service. Uh, and net promoter scores are well above 70%. Okay. And that's an equivalent of what USAA, Apple, Trader Joe's uh, type net promoter scores for customers. Well, I want to comment on something from the human kind of psychology, behavioral psychology uh, standpoint. From a salesperson's perspective, if I can lead my prospect, my potential customer, to the conclusion themselves that this is the right thing for them by appropriate questioning and positioning and framing of benefits, I'm not convincing them to yeah. say yes. You let them hopefully come to the conclusion themselves. They feel more comfortable about saying yes. They feel, you know, happy with the outcome. There wasn't yeah. a sale that actually happened because they effectively sold themselves. So it's just interesting hearing you yeah. say that they, you get a higher adherence level right. when your patient sets up their own framework and gets you to endorse it rather than the other way around. That's really interesting to it hear. PlanSight is a complete game changer in the world of insurance brokerage. As a broker, you know how time consuming and error prone the traditional RFP process can be. But well, what if I told you there's a better way? PlanSight is the only end-to-end -end RFP solution on the market made specifically for benefits agencies. It's like having a superpower that gets you an average of eight to 10 hours back 
per employee renewal per year. And the best part, PlanSite supports all carriers, all funding types, and all group sizes for over 20 different benefits. If you're ready to make your RFP process faster, more efficient, and more profitable, it's time to call PlanSite. Visit PlanSite.com now to book a free demo and discover the future of insurance renewals. And oftentimes, if they set it up themselves, they're more likely to start it, but they also, most of the time, need some accountability. Okay. And so we scheduled weekly follow-ups. And most of the time it was over text, you know, or text or phone, mm -hmm. not in person. Um, and with direct primary care, I probably couldn't do that in fee for service because it wouldn't be reimbursed. Um, but in direct primary care, it's a monthly fee. I can do whatever, you know, whatever makes sense to the patient. And yeah. so, so we'd follow up and say, how's it going? And then sometimes you say, oh, shoot, you know, I slipped back. I said, okay, that's all right. You know, let's not feel guilty over, but let's keep Mm -hmm. Let's keep sticking to the things that you want to do. And he's like, yep, all right, we're going to plan on doing that. Or sometimes you'd be traveling and, and things would, you know, would slip up a little bit. But the thing is, is that we just needed that consistency. And, and I love that about direct primary care. Cause a lot of times if I start the, if you start somebody on a new chronic medication, mm -hmm. adherence to that medicine is less than 50% either taking it or doing it correctly. And so okay. what we, we've built into the system is that we always have follow-ups within two weeks. Whenever a new medicine started, say, hey, are you having any side effects to this medicine? Uh, are you uh, finding that it's benefiting you? Is it, um, or is there an interaction with another medicine that you're taking? So we can kind of troubleshoot and problem solve because a lot of times people say, oh, I'm having some, some muscle aches to this, to this medicine and they just stop it and I never find out. And so I always wanna make sure I've got those follow-ups to know exactly how things are going. Well, that's just, I mean, there's just the quality of interaction. So it's not just the time that's spent, but the follow-ups and the ease of access, right? Yeah. It's a big thing. Um, and I, I do want to spend a moment on kind of the, how people interface with you today or, or interface with DPC and why those touch points exist. But I don't think we brought us up to speed where you were, you're now at this point in your timeline, uh, pra your own practice, correct? Yep. So, so you exited that DaVita model after, I think you said 12, 12 years or so? Uh, it was 10 years. So it was about four okay. years ago. Uh, and, is that when you had to stop in Kenya then? And I'm trying to track the time. Oh, I, I did have a non-compete for okay. a year. And okay. so my family, I, we went to Nairobi for the for the year. And that okay. was during COVID. This so is during it, COVID? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you spent, uh, tw I think, 2020, you said, uh, uh, in Nairobi. Yeah, in okay. Nairobi. So what was that experience like? I mean, that's, oh, uh, that's got to be such a unique life experience. And what were you doing while you were there as well? I, I was volunteering in the health uh, in the health system. the health, And we were taking care of a lot. There was not a whole lot of COVID there. So I, I was taking care of... Uh, injuries, diabetes, high blood, there's a lot of high blood pressure and congestive heart failure. Okay. Um, I, I was there 20 years ago and there was a lot of HIV and tuberculosis. And now with a lot of the Gates Foundation grants, hardly any uncontrolled HIV or tuberculosis because so, so it seemed a little bit more like Western medicine. Uh, I was taking care of a lot of the typical things that I take care of uh, in the United States. Um, uh, and my kids went to school uh, at the international school there, and uh, we had a fairly normal life during COVID there because uh, there was a lot less um, uh, significant, severe COVID okay. cases that were going on. How, how did you just out of curiosity? How did your kids adapt to uh, that? You know, they did well. We asked them afterwards how much we scarred them, <laughs> and they said no. They really they enjoyed it, and they were in a school with kids from fifty other countries, so they met kids uh, from Asia, from from Africa, from Europe. And, oh, and okay. I think it was just a really good I mean, talk about a life, a life experience, right? And they were what? In early They're in middle school. Middle time. school. Okay. My goodness. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be fantastic. But then, so you sort of waited out your non-compete, it sounds like. Well, I waited out. I wanted to honor it. Uh, okay. And and then I came. And while I Did was- Did you know what you wanted to do when you got back? Oh, I, I yeah. want to start my own practice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And while I was there, I got a call from Hint Health because mm -hmm. they, Hint Health does the software for for billing and member services for almost all of the direct primary care independent practices across the United States is about 4,000 currently and growing by, I think the, the growth was uh, like 300%, you know, over the last several years uh, in terms of the number of new practices. And, um, and they were starting to get employers and uh, brokers and TPAs that were interested in how, how, how can they offer direct primary care to their employers that are in larger geographies. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, why don't we set up a network of all of our, our direct primary cares that are using our software? We've already got a relationship with them. Why don't we okay. just kind of band together 
and have a single point of contracting to make it a lot easier since so that the employee employers don't have to try and contract with 50 different DPCs and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not necessarily know the quality or not necessarily know um, how they matched up. Were they full? Were they not full? Uh, and so um, one of the, uh, the COO at Hint, he used to work with me at Paladina and he goes, well, I've got a doctor that might be one. And there's corporate practice of medicine laws. And so in order to set up a, a practice it has to be owned by a, a physician. And he goes, I, I've got a doctor that, you know, was uh, in corporate leadership at Paladina that, that might be able, might be interested in this, but he's in Africa. And I'm like, <laughs> what in the world? Do you want a, a guy in Africa to set up a company for us? And so um, at this time, our CEO of, um, of Hint, he's from New Zealand. And so he was in New Zealand at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the COO was in uh, San Francisco. So that's where Hint is from, San Francisco. Okay. Uh, our network person was in uh, in Boston and I was in Africa. So we, I was 10 o'clock my time. We had a conversation and we just thought this is gonna be great. So we decided to do it. So yeah. I, I joined up and we uh, created Hint Connect, okay. which is a network of, of independent direct primary care practices. So it's easier for employers, uh, benefit aggregators, brokers to be able to add a DPC benefit to the self-funded plan. Well, and that's what, that's one of the biggest constraints that we were talking about over coffee, right? Is just standing these up, right? Whether yeah. it's a brick and mortar purely, or whether there's a virtual component to it as well, whether you're pulling from multiple, uh, you know, population cohorts, for, cohorts from multiple employers, or there's yeah. a single employer set up, right? There's some just con- geography, right? It seems to be the limiting factor. And so this model you're saying is helping you overcome some of those constraints, right? Right. So we're we're not, if some, if an employer wants a geography, we are not having to start from scratch. We don't have to build a, a, a brick and mortar clinic. We don't have to hire a doctor because that process takes six to nine months to do that. We are tapping into existing DPC practices that would like to have some more uh, patient volume. Okay. To, and so we say, hey, are you interested? And make sure that they're doing all the things that we expect. We want to make sure that they're doing full spectrum family practice, that they're doing uh, urgent care, chronic disease management, that they're going to promise same day, next day appointments, uh, for especially for urgent issues, that they're going to keep their cell phone hour on all the time so that their uh, patients can contact them after mm-hmm. hours and on mm-hmm. weekends. Uh, and to make sure we, we vet them, to make sure that they're uh, licensed, credentialed, and make sure that they're doing good quality care. Uh, and then we'll say, hey, which of these DPCs fit your geography uh, and um, and make it the easy button for them. Well, and especially I think that helps when employers aren't just concentrated in one location, right? right? Many employers have people spread out. I mean, we have we have two offices and then we have a ton of remote people at, at Pareto Health. So can you help a company like that, that has people spread out across the U.S. and still find a solution for everybody. That, that's what we're there for. Okay. So we're, if, if there is a concentration of employees and dependents all within one direct primary care, don't use Hint Connect. Just contract directly with the direct primary care that's okay. right there. Because that, that would be the simplest, the easiest. But if you're spread out and it's going to be very complicated, you have to contract with numerous DPCs uh, that it could be much more complicated. It's it's hard to to do the legwork and then also having to pay the bills every month. Mm-hmm. Uh, to have it streamlined with one contract and one payment. So Hint Connect has got all of the the billing software. We do the eligibility, the enrollment, and all of that built in. And so we we use the Hint software that's been used for the last ten years the same software that we use for billing for all the DPC practices. And what is a, I wanted to ask you, what is the chief medical officer's role in all of this? Yeah. Right? So I, I know a lot of companies nowadays and even the healthcare space have CMOs. Yeah. What, what is your role? What do you bring to the table? So, so first off, I have to uh, get all the medical licenses. So I need medical licenses in 50 states. Oh, no kidding. Each one. Okay. Yeah, in order to be able to run this. So, so I have been, busy doing, <laughs> yeah, doing acquiring medical, and it's actually expensive and it's very time consuming to do that. Uh, the second thing is, is that I'm also having to sign all the contracts and assume the risk. Uh, so I'm uh, doing the contracts with both the supply side and the demand side. Okay. Um, uh, the next thing is, is um, we've got a team that we vet and meet all the DPC practices. And as long as they meet certain criteria, then I may not get involved. But if there's concerns, questions, then they come to me and I will have those conversations. Okay. Then when we do sale on this on the 
um, when we're working with uh, with brokers or TPAs or employers, oftentimes they would like to be chatting with a doctor to under, truly understand the DPC experience. And oh, okay. so I'm involved in those conversations. We do have a sales team. We have uh, our um, our head of uh, Hint Connect who comes from the insurance world, mm -hmm. and she understands that much better than I do. But oftentimes it's helpful to have a physician in the room to be able to say, okay, this is how my, and I'm, and I'm not only the chief medical officer of this network, I'm also one of those points of the network. So I can say, this is how it works yeah. in practice. In yeah, practicality. I mean, what better level of credibility than to say, I actually do this myself, right? Yep. So I want to stress that, right? You're the chief medical officer at Hint Connect, but you're also still a practicing TPC doctor as well. You said you're kind of almost signing a contract with yourself, so right? At some point, <laughs> at some point, right? Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but so, so you're a practicing physician still. So where is your, your location? Is in Colorado? So I'm in Littleton, Colorado, okay. and we've got four physicians in our, in our group, uh, and three, uh, three medical assistants. And so we take care of uh, both um, employer um, em employees uh, from an employer group, but also do some retail as well. So a direct, you can have a direct to consumer model than Correct. an we individual. So what percentage of, of makeup is? I, we're more retail. Hand. So well, okay. I, I say my practice, the other three I would say is very heavily uh, retail. My practice, I would say it's closer to by 60, 40. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're doing both of these jobs concurrently. So you're, yeah. you're either uh -huh. working a lot of hours or very good at maximizing the efficiency and I, of your and time. I, I have to be careful not to do too much for either one. So of course. I, I, I have a smaller patient panel as a result. Understood. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure just you're passionate about doing that. That's why you continue to, to yeah. provide care. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm an employer listening to this, why would I consider this model? What are some of the most compelling arguments of why you would want to abandon the fee for service model for your population and get them on DPC? Yeah. Well, I, I think employers are interested in the triple aim, making sure there's cost, quality, and customer satisfaction. I think the, the, quality and customer satisfaction are very easily easy to, to demonstrate. Uh, there have been some studies that have been done with um, cost. Uh, the Milliman study that came out uh, a couple years ago uh, took a look at um, an employer that was self-funded, had 2,000 uh, 2, lives that were on the plan. And they gave them the option. They said, hey, you can do direct primary care or you can do the fee-for-service PPO option. Mm -hmm. uh, and they took a look after the year. I think they, um, uh, they would um, uh, risk stratify them, mm -hmm. uh, risk adjust, uh, and then lop off uh, the outliers uh, and took a look at total uh, healthcare spend to the plan at the end of the year after 12 months. Uh, and there was a 40% reduction in emergency room use okay. with the direct primary care compared to the fee for service. And actually that's not surprising on Monday, uh, you know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, I had a patient call me up, uh, his 20 year old, uh, that was on a skateboard. Mm -hmm. He fell, injured his foot. It was really swollen, very bruised couldn't put any weight on it. Okay. And he was like, Hey, I, I know you tell me that I always have to call. I, I want you, you tell me that I want him to call me first before going to emergency right. or urgent care, because nine times out of 10, I can take care of it. Uh, and he said, I'm just doing that, but I'm on my way to the emergency room. And I said, okay, well, before you do that, let me just, and I asked him the questions, any numbness, uh, how's the, uh, the pain level? How's, uh, is there any, um, uh, cold temper? I just want to make sure there was nothing there that was an emergency. And there wasn't. Uh, okay. And so I said, well, you can for sure go to the emergency room, but that's going to be an automatic $3,000 bill. What we could do as an option is I could give you some pain medicines and you could just rest tonight. I mean, can you, can we, do you think we could get this pain under control and I'll get you in. I've got the cash bundled price at our, uh, at our orthopedic uh, guy, mm. uh, and it's two hundred dollars for the X-ray and the visit and the treatment, wow. uh, all in one. Uh, and but but it's, whatever you want to do. And he's like, oh well, I think if you call in some medicines, I could just ice it and and just stay in bed and then and then wait till the morning. It'll be another ten hours. And so he decided to do that. Uh, got the X-ray. Actually, no, fra it wasn't fractured. Wasn't even fractured. Wasn't wow. even fractured. Okay. Probably a really bad sprain. Yeah. 
put him in a boot. Uh, and I chatted with him a couple of days ago, and he was doing okay. I mean, he's still pretty un- pretty sore. Yeah. Uh, but he was doing okay. We're gonna repeat the X-ray just, just in case sure. there might yeah. have been just some weight. He couldn't do weight bearing X-rays. But we're gonna do a repeat uh, X-ray uh, next week, weight bearing, just to make sure there's n- nothing that we're missing or any severe ligament uh, damage. But this is the type of care that you get. Now, if I was in fee, if that patient was in fee for service, they would probably call the hospital triage center and they would say, Ooh, that's probably, that's worrisome for an X, uh, for a fracture. You should go to, you the, should emergency go to the emergency room. room. You know, right, right. urgent cares are closed. You should go to the emergency room. And that would have, and I had another patient that was uh, 37 years old a few weeks ago and very, very anxious person. And I know her very well. And she called and she thought she was having a heart attack. Okay. Uh, and I asked her all the questions. It was clear clear that it was a panic attack. Okay. Uh, and she was thinking about going to the emergency room. So I said, okay, we're just going to talk. We're going to talk you through this thing. After 15 minutes, the, the panic attack went away, like as, as expected. And uh, and she felt a ton better. We adjusted her medicines. I saw her the next day, did an EKG, made sure that we weren't mm-hmm. missing anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would have probably been about a four four $4,000 uh, ER bill. Uh, and I think she had a low deductible plan, so that would have probably hit the plan pretty hard. Right. So it's not surprising when you have patients that are educated to contact their personal doctor who knows them well, mm. that they access this, that you have a significant reduction in ER visits, but we also have a significant reduction in um, inpatient visits as well, because if we're taking better care of their chronic conditions, absolutely, 80, 85% of spend is chronic conditions and the subsequent problems and surgeries and hospitalizations from chronic conditions. So if we can have those optimally managed, so a 20% reduction in inpatient um, hospitalization is not unusual. And after one year, we find that pay, uh, employers typically save money, but the studies have not yet been done for the, the two and the three. But our employers always say that their, that their cost goes down significantly by year two and year three. But the problem with year one is that a lot of patients come to us yeah. and they haven't had their colonoscopy, haven't had their mammogram or pap smear. So we end up doing all these preventive things which add cost to the plan for the short term. But then once once they've been in the system for two, three, that's when we usually get the 20 to 25% reduction in spend. Yeah, I don't doubt it, right? And I think one of the things outside of costs that I like, and you just described it, is there's an access component to care, right? There's an immediacy of access to a doctor. Yeah. And it's not just access because I can get a hold of you. There's also the access because the impediment of expenditure is not there, right? right? So this being, most of these are obviously coming through an employer channel where the employer is sponsoring or paying the membership fee. So I, as a member, am not worried about what this is going to cost me. So that psychology is not in the back of my mind and going, I, yeah, I probably should go, but I'm worried about the cost or I haven't hit my deductible yet or whatever the case may be. But I really love the fact that you're accessible um, via text, you said, was pretty common, right? But didn't you say the majority or that's really the starting point for most people is text, correct? In fee-for-service, patients would access, they'd call or they first wait uh, and they'd have to go through the phone tree and then they would get somebody on the line and then they would schedule an appointment whether they necessarily needed an pa- uh, appointment or not. Uh, and in fee-for-service, it's really difficult to get texts and, and phone calls reimbursed, uh, at least pre-pandemic. It's a little bit better now, but still not great. But in direct primary care, it's flipped its exact opposite. Mm-hmm. Almost all of my patients, their first uh, access point is texting. It's text. Okay. They text me first okay. and they're like, Hey, I need a refill of my blood pressure medicine. And then I go reply, reply back done. Yeah. And yeah. then they're like, thanks. Cool. <laughs> All right. That's it. And then they go, right. see you later, dude. Uh-huh. No, you're just very informal, right? <laughs> uh, and, and most of them, they always call me Dr. Dave. Right? Dr. Hey, thanks, Dave. Dr. Dave. Uh, and then sometimes they're like, hey, you know, I've got this rash. And they send me a picture. Yeah. Uh, they just text me the picture. Uh, and it's all secure, sure. HIPAA compliant yeah. texting yeah. app that we use. Uh, and so then and I'll, we'll, we'll go back and forth a little bit and ask a few more questions, find out if it's poison ivy or if it's eczema or psoriasis or something like that. Uh, but then most of the time it can take care of it. But other times they're like, hey, you know, I'd like to... Um, talk to you a little bit more about, um, you know, I'd like to, to lose some weight. Uh, and, and, and I say, would you like to come in person or do you want to do this, uh, through a video visit or do you want to do over the phone? Um, and so then they pick, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. seems Mm -hmm. to make, if they, sometimes people, they just like to be in person and they feel like there's more of a connection that way, but other people, they travel a lot, they're busy. Uh, they're in their office. They're like, no, gosh, can we just do this virtually? I'd love to do that. 
in my mind, if if we can do it virtually, what, whatever makes sense to the mm-hmm. patient also makes sense for the the thing that we're trying to do. I'm happy to do that uh, because it doesn't make any difference to me uh, because the financial model does not restrict us. Well, what, is there a downside to that accessibility from the doctor perspective? Sometimes patients want things virtual when they really need to be seen in person. Okay. You know, sometimes you know they're like, hey, gosh, you know, I um, I've got this severe abdominal pain, and would you, you know, or sometimes if they you know, have like an ear pain, they think it's an ear infection and they don't have the, the Taito, um, you know, they don't have the otoscope that's electronic mm-hmm. to yeah. send me the pictures. Yeah. Then I'm like, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit. I, or if there's things that truly need an exam and they want to do it virtually, sometimes there's pressure to do that. But most of the time I have great relationships with my patients. I mean, they're really, it feels like a family. Most of them, they feel like, I'm taking care of family members or extended family members. And so most of them, like, if, if I have a, a reason why it makes sense to have them come on in, they're like, oh, oh I get it. I'll, I'll go okay. ahead and come on in. Yeah. One is, is a 24 hour or 24 seven access to you, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, how do you, I mean, obviously sometimes you might get phone calls at three in the clock in the night that wake you up, right? Yeah. So what is that like you, from your perspective? You know what? I, I, I actually track this for my first two years. Okay. On average, I get about two after hours calls per week. So it's not, too, not bad. too bad. Not yeah. too bad. Yeah. Uh, and in those two years, I only had one after hours calls between what after hours call between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. And it was a, a six month old that had a fever of 102, which was like really appropriate. Yeah. The thing is, we have such great access during the day that most people are like, oh, this isn't that urgent. I'll just take care of it. Uh, I'll, I'll just contact him, mm-hmm. you know, at eight o'clock in the morning and we'll get it taken care of right away. And so really patients own, they, they, and they know I have got kids and I've got a life and, mm-hmm. and we, I'm going to my kids soccer games. And, uh, and so they, they understand that. And so they're not going to do things that they know are going to be a problem. Now, if they were in a hospital system, they might say, Oh, it's 11 o'clock. Gosh, why don't I just go ahead and contact them right now to get my refill? Um, just because I'm thinking of it. Yeah. But my patients would never do that because they were like, oh, I don't want to wake up Dr. Cameron at 11 o'clock. Uh, yeah. I'm kind of an early to bed person. So uh, <laughs> uh, 11 o'clock because because I can easily get that taken care of at 8 o'clock in the, in the morning. morning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's that's great. So I, I don't see that as a problem. Honestly, I forget that I'm on call. Most of the time, it kind of feels like my dad calling me like, oh, Dave, I smashed my thumb. Now it's all bruised. What should I do? <laughs> it's kind of like that. And I'm like, of course I've got to tell my dad what to do and, and yeah. help him and be able to navigate this complex healthcare system uh, and get them the care that he needs. You know? well, what, speaking of care, what, what, what is uh, under the umbrella that is DPC? Yeah. What percentage or like what type of procedures can be done? And then what stuff rises to the occasion that needs to leave your yeah. four walls? Yeah. So like in, in our practice, we'll do all the CLIA wave tests, which are the tests that are done um and authorized to be able to do in clinic. And so those are like doing EKGs. We can do uh, like a pregnancy test, a urine uh, dip test. We can do strep, uh, mm. COVID, mono, all those types of things. Uh, procedure wise, we do a lot of skin, lumps and bumps, freezing warts, uh, place IUDs, do endometrial biopsies, lots of those types of things. Uh, Any minor cuts and cuts, you know, stitches, stitches, and, yeah, all that kind x-rays, of stuff. X-rays, I think uh, you said as well. We don't have x-rays don't, on oh, site. Okay, some, okay. some do, have, uh, but most have very low cost cash pricing just down the street. I mean, ours, okay. um, we send them just a couple minutes away. They get their x-rays for like 50 bucks. Uh, they can run it through the insurance they want, but cash pricing is so good. And also we've got great cash pricing for labs. So, um, uh, there's lab core requests. Those are the two big national, um, yep. uh, labs. And so instead of going through insurance, a lot of our patients prefer our cash price cause it's 80% discount. So like annual, like standard annual labs are $44 at our clinic with our cash price. And so we say, happy to run it through insurance if you want, but if you want to pay $44 cash, you could do that too. Cause a lot of people don't meet their deductibles and they prefer that cause it's cheaper than the cash price they get through their insurance. Makes sense. Is there anything though that a traditional fee for service model could deliver that you cannot deliver in DPC? No. Okay. Right. So there's, there's no, you're not getting uh, uh, a compromised version of no. primary care. No, no, it's, it's a, it's a more robust. Yeah. Yeah. So then how do we make this model more common, right? That That's the big question I have, right? I'm sure you have plenty of opinions, but just make people more aware, 
recruit more physicians to this model, obviously get more employers convinced that this is appropriate. Like, where do we go? Well, you know what? I, I actually have been promoting with a lot of the employers that I take care of, the CEOs, the CEO, uh, CFOs, mm-hmm. and, and uh, with a couple of them, I just said, hey, I'll give you a three-month free membership so you could just see, see, see what it's like. Yeah. And, they, and then they sign up and stay, and then they're like, okay, how do we get the rest of the employees on board? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. um, if they're fully funded, it's more tricky because now we're doing an add-on. Yeah. They're already paying. And so then I'm like, okay, how can we get you to at least level funded or to some type of uh, captive, mm-hmm. you know, so that we can be able to make this more affordable for you. So it's mm-hmm. not just going to be an additional cost onto the, the fully funded plan. Now, fully insured is a, is a match that works really well with direct primary care because fully the, insured or self-funded. Sorry, did I, yeah, I, yeah, you said, I just want to make I sure yeah. I meant to say Self, self-funded, self-funded, self-funded. Yeah, yeah. because what we do best is we cap we we make sure that we I mean, we got a captive cost mm-hmm. right that's that's fixed mm-hmm. and then if we can get those get the patients to be uh, enrolled and engaged the beauty about direct primary care is that when patients sign up after the first year 85 percent of patients because they're paying for this or they're getting this free benefit where all everything's incentivized there's no copay there's no coinsurance mm-hmm. to come that they utilize it. Uh, and with 85, so we get about 85% uh, engagement, meaning they're using the service. And if people have chronic conditions, it's up to like 97%. Okay. Wow. And so if we can get people to, to utilize the direct primary care, instead of going to a lot of people, they don't have a primary care. So they might go to their cardiologist for their high blood pressure, their dermatologist for their acne. They might go to their pulmonologist for their asthma, and they might go uh, to their orthopedic surgeon for their sore ankle where all of that stuff can be done mm-hmm. at a fixed cost in direct primary mm-hmm. care. And then you get rid of all those downstream costs. It's fragmented. And then sometimes there's duplication of the same tests because you're seeing multiple doctors. You get interactions with medicines mm-hmm. from different doctors that are prescribing the same thing. So so if uh, employers um, can see that there is going to be value in steering um, patients to direct primary care and then avoiding the expensive downstream costs, especially an expensive specialty care that's unnecessary, unnecessary ER visits and unnecessary hospitalizations. There's actually been studies that have shown there's decreased in surgeries by using direct primary oh, care as well. I don't doubt that um, for a minute. Just, just because they get taken care of in a less acute setting. Yeah. And so, and so it's, to me, it's from a financial standpoint, um, it's not very difficult to make the system more efficient. And you're gonna be investing more in primary care, um, but the downstream cost for expensive care offsets that. Absolutely, I mean, it, to me, it starts to get closer towards that. I'm always talking about incentives. Um, you know, the good incentives in our industry, there's misaligned incentives as well that incentivize behavior that's not ideal. Um, yeah. Some of it's compensation based, you know, for the consultants and things like that. But this to me seems like an alignment of incentives because like you said, it does capture some, it puts uh, primary care in a bucket. Yeah. Although I'm a big component or proponent of take these variable costs, control your claims. That's where your opportunity is. But you take a variable cost and then you control one right. of those variables and put it over here where it's more predictable. But I do think the long-term result, like you said, is not only can we prove that it pays for itself, but how much are we capturing early on? How much are we preventing from happening downstream? How many unnecessary surgeries and tests and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's the impact I think is clearly demonstrable right. um, with anybody that's done it. But it's again, it's that awareness that we, we have to do a better job of. How do we get physicians though? to be interested in this, because it doesn't come down to have enough physicians willing to do this. ClaimDoc is a medical claim auditing and member advocacy company. We provide fiduciary services to employer-sponsored benefit plans, allowing them to create an environment where we ensure that the benefit plans are being charged in a fair and reasonable basis. My business is basically people, and it become a real simple transition. We thought it was gonna be far more complex. I've saved We'll say hundreds of thousands of dollars. I could not say enough about ClaimDoc. Do one more point oh, yeah. on what you said, yeah. and then I'll get to that yeah, question. Please. So one of the challenges with, with fee-for-service, especially if you're working with a, a multi-specialty hospital-owned group uh, or hospital system that's um, that's got a bunch of primary care attached, is that 
the primary care doctors have no idea how much things cost. And so the mm. most expensive thing is the primary care doctor's pen because like, hey, we <laughs> do a referral to MRI and then the referral coordinator decides where that goes. And if the referral coordinator is is part of that hospital system, they will refer internally to a place that's got a facility fee, which is more expensive than the independents. Yeah. Uh, same thing with uh, specialty care and the surgery. Uh, it just ends up being more expensive. And the primary care has no idea how much it costs. Now, in direct primary care, we are highly incentive to save our employers money because if we save them money, they'll continue to utilize our direct primary care. So our, we have aligned incentives to take really good care of patients, to give them great customer satisfaction, and to help them save money because then they'll be happy and then they'll re-up. Yeah. Um, and so I know what everything costs. <laughs> I know I know the cost of every location for MRI, and MRI can be a 10x difference between one place and another for the exact same thing. It's a commodity. Yeah. Colonoscopy is the same thing. I can do it for 1900 or we can do it for 3500 depending on where you send the person. Okay. And so... Part of the value prop is that we are investing in, in doctors who understand cost transparency and will work with people. And I don't force people. I always tell people, hey, where do you want to go? This is how much it costs you to go here. Mm -hmm. This is how much you go. And these are the people that I like, and this is the quality that goes along with it. And they're, they're, I, they're using my expertise to help them navigate the the system and they have no idea like patients would not know the different costs or where the quality is and okay. so we help them navigate that now you asked about uh, doctors yeah yeah how yeah. do we so the the two things that scare physicians so doctors are risk averse mm -hmm. most doctors uh, want to have stability in their finances and they also want to be competent medical school and residency does not train us how to be business owners or how to run a business. Okay. And so it's terrifying to most doctors to think, oh my goodness, I'm gonna go out and start up a practice. I have to figure out how to do a lease, how to hire a medical assistant, how to <laughs> get supplies, yeah. how to set up a tech stack, which attorney do I need to use? What about financial help? How do I do that and how much work is it gonna take and am I gonna be good at that? So that's terrifying for most doctors. The second is, is if you start up a direct primary care practice, unlike fee for service where you've got patients knocking down your door because that's, like, if you start a fee for service practice, you'll be full in seconds. Okay. Um, but in direct primary care, you start with zero patients. Yeah. Yep. So there's expenses that you still have to pay. So it took me, I, I, my break even point was at 50 patients. Um, and it took about four to five months. Uh, so, okay. so I had side gigs to help me get through. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, um, but, but that being said, those were things I thought about pretty significantly because, um, I, you know, I've got kids. And I also mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that we we're not going to be breaking, breaking our financial bank for our family. Um, and so those are the two big obstacles for why doctors are afraid to enter direct primary care. Okay. Then are there entities that help or assist with the setup, right? So you yeah. obviously help with the funnel of getting patients to, to that primary care uh, location, but establishing it, whether they're building it or there's an existing location that they can lease. Obviously, they need income. I mean, like, so are there entities that help with the onboarding process yeah. for a physician? Yeah, so there are different types of direct primary care. Some are enterprise-level direct primary care where there are larger organizations that employ all of the doctors. Okay. And so that's kind of the easy button yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for, uh, and so Paladina, where I came from, was that model. Uh, and so uh, they would employ doctors, pay them a salary, uh, and they would take care of patients and Paladina would take, and now uh, Paladina is rebranded for Everside. Um, now, individual practices um, such as ours, we mm -hmm. could potentially hire other doctors and pay them a salary and have them come on board, gotcha. or we can bring them on as colleagues. And so the model I, I, I like that I'm very interested in is what a lot of specialty practices will do is do a um, medical services um, organization uh, okay. style where you can have a bunch of doctors that share expenses, share brand, but have independent practices. They'll bill separately, uh, but it makes it so that they don't, each doctor doesn't have to recreate the wheel. They can yeah. have, they can join a practice, just like an orthopedic surgeon joins another practice with 10 other uh, physicians. They might uh, still do their own billing, but they're gonna contribute towards the expenses, but someone else is gonna be running the practice and they'll pay for those services. Mm -hmm. What if I'm Dr. Sally, who's coming out of, uh, 
That's cool. And I am hell bent on doing this on my own and I am mission driven and I believe in DPC and I want to go out on my own and build it. Like what would that look like in your mind if you were going to build it from scratch? Well, I would say first join Hit Connect because we can help uh, um, so step bring some one. employer, employer yep. patients to you. Uh, I would also recommend utilizing the Hint resources because we've got a Hint uh, accelerator program and, and we've got a, there, there's lots of, there's a conference on nuts and bolts. There's the DPC summit, which have tracks that teach you how to do a direct prime, how to start your direct primary care. Very cool. Uh, and so I would highly recommend going to one of those conferences uh, so that you can be able to identify like, okay, what are the, what are the steps we got to do first? How do I get the, how do, how do I get the lease? What are the tenant improvements I need to do? What are the equipment yeah. needs? What yeah. are, how do I hire a medical assistant? And you can get contracts and you can get some contacts for some financial help uh, and, uh, and some legal help. See, that's well. yeah, so kind of, it's like, how do we, um, I don't know if it's the right word, but how do we how do we streamline yeah. that onboarding process? Because I think you said only six percent of people in pre med are, are going down the primary so, care track. So prime pri uh, family medicine. Family so, medicine. So okay. primary care would be pediatrics, internal medicine, okay. family medicine, and uh, and historically that has been significantly lower in the United States compared to many of our European and other developed countries. Um, percentage of going into primary we have incentivized uh, specialty care and procedural care much okay. more in the United States because of the uh, reimbursement structure. Um, and so as a result, family medicine has had problems recruiting. Uh, and because like from my experience, it's it's not an easy life and the reimbursement is not great. And so we have a shortage, right? We have a significant shortage. Okay, Because okay, yeah. okay. what I would like to hopefully be a part of is just simply drawing attention to this, right? And so people know this is out there. I mean, I wish there were, I don't know. I mean, I hate when government in intervenes too much, but incentives that would like, uh, you know, sort of push uh, this model to a degree. But it seems so obvious, right? That if we, the more primary care that was delivered through this channel, yeah. the better off everybody in the equation would yeah. be, right? Um, and so it's just, it's one of those things that I, as soon as I latched onto it, kind of like when I saw self-funding for the first time, I'm like, that makes way too much sense. And yeah. so once you know what you know, you can't kind of unknow. Yeah. Uh, so then where do we go from here? So let's zoom out for the podcast. Let's start uh, kind of closing this thing out. The big picture of this with DPC. We've talked a lot of brass tacks, but growth of it, where it's going to go in the next few years, how we expand it. Like, what are your thoughts there? So interestingly enough, since the pandemic, um, fee for service has contracted by 11% and direct myra care has increased by over 370%. Okay. Um, and so it's expanding. Now there's about 4,000 of us, uh, across the United States right now. And so we are expanding. Interestingly enough, the family medicine, our, the American Academy of Family Physicians are very supportive of direct primary care and they're, um, they're promoting it with uh, medical students, with residents. And so instead of us having to go to the med schools and mm -hmm. residency programs and having to teach them, they know about it now. Yeah, yeah. And in, in my mind, when I was a med student, this is the kind of practice I imagined that I would be doing, doing direct primary care. And there's so many idealistic med students out there that want to be doing this type of care. And now they're like, well, that's what I want to do. And so in terms of how do we start recruiting the best medical students to go into primary care, I think you just have the best job ever. And direct primary care is so fun. It is the most mm. professionally re rewarding job I can imagine. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Yeah. I mean, I tell my kids, and actually some of my kids, sometimes our kids are like, hey, I want to be a doctor. And I, I don't know if it's because of direct primary care, but when I was at fee for service, I would have steered my kids away. I've said, do not do what I'm doing. Yeah, that's it, a shame. It, yeah. But but now I feel like this is this is this is sheer joy. It's so fun. Well, I can tell. I mean, it's palpable, but I think just it's the restoration of the doctor-patient relationship, what care, health care is supposed to include care. Yeah. And I think the fee for service model, you know, um, what to say, expels the care from the equation. Um, and so now not only is it the quality of time, it's the relationship you and I have, the bond that can be formed, yeah. the trust that can be formed, the fact that I can actually get you to listen to me and yeah. spend some time with me enough to us really come to um, sort of an amenable conclusion to what, what I had, the problem that I have. I mean, I think all those are what I think care was supposed to be about in the first place. And so what's old is new again. I mean, I think the, the old days of sure. doctors going to your home, right, is not uh, all of a sudden that seems like a shiny new thing as well. I, you did say that could 
potentially be part of the model as well, where sometimes you can have at, at home visits too, right? Yeah. And, and many direct primary care uh, practices will do that. I, I don't think all of them would say that. It kind of depends on the geography of the patients and how far away they are. But I, I stop by my employer's offices and see patients. Sometimes that's more efficient and effective because yeah, yeah, yeah. I can kind of see them uh, very quickly. It's kind of a Marcus Welby. I mean, some of the some of my older patients who remember Marcus Welby, the small town uh, doc, it, it, that's the feel. It's the feel of a high tech, small town 1950s doc is how some people describe the experience of being a patient in our practice. Uh, and it's back to having a trusting relationship and that, that feels like I'm on their side. I am a person that wants the best for them. It's a complicated healthcare system, and I'm there to help them figure out how to best get what's their, what their goals and well, what do, meets do their values. Do you think DPC could play a big part in, in quote unquote, saving the American healthcare system? I, I think that has been my desire is to have direct primary care transform our healthcare system so it can function the way it is designed for particularly for patient care, mm -hmm. uh, to be delivered in a way that's compassionate, that is high quality, that's cost effective, uh, and it aligns incentives for employers, patients, and doctors. Yeah. Whereas the current structure pits us against each other. Direct primary care gets us into the same, we all want the same thing. We all mm -hmm. want the triple aim. Yep. And we did say that you kind of need to be self-funded to, to do it as well, right? I it mean, is the best. Yeah. I, yeah. I encourage all of my employers to think heavily about that or to figure out how to get themselves in a scenario where they can be self-funded so that the savings that comes along with direct primary care, they can realize that. Yeah. And I think so too. And right. I mean, I, I, we were talking uh, off camera, but obviously in, in a captive model, a DPC uh, solution makes Perfect. a lot of sense, right? Of sort of controlling one of those uh, silos uh, of cost and, and, and making it a lot more predictable, right? And then yeah. not only is it making more predictable, but it also is going to prevent a lot of that, uh, the upcharging and the, the incentives that we have to drive people through the system, yeah. you know, the unnecessary care delivery and things like that. So again, those two things co coalesce very nicely um, and the risk is better because of that uh, input. So closing thoughts, we've talked a lot and I, I feel like you and I could talk another hour, but we got to get going here. So uh, the folks that have stuck around with us this, this, uh, this long, Dr. Dave, yeah. what do you have to say to those uh, folks before we part? Well, I must say I've really enjoyed um, conversations and relationships that we have with a lot of innovative brokers, uh, benefit advisors, mm -hmm. TPAs, benefit aggregators that understand that direct primary care is fundamentally different uh, than fee for service and can add a significant value for their employer groups. Yeah. Uh, and so I think we can partner really nicely. Um, we've got a team uh, and we've got a plan in place. We're in 37 states. We're gonna be in all 50 states next year. Okay. Uh, we're gonna keep adding on more direct primary care practices so that we'll be in, in every community so that we can be able to pair up the patients uh, where they are in their location with DPCs. Uh, we also do have partnerships uh, with a virtual uh, DPC vendor called Eden Health. Okay. Uh, and so if, they're, if someone is particularly remote and it's very difficult for them uh, to get to a DPC, we can uh, u utilize that virtual primary care. I do believe that most patients do enjoy an in-person visit. Uh, and, and I think that helps uh, with the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, but I am very optimistic that we're going to have um, significant improvements in our healthcare system by doing these novel, um, these novel plans. Well, I share your optimism. I really do. The transparency laws that are coming out, just the the access to data, right? So, mm -hmm. so cost data, shopping data, things like that. I do think there's a light being shined on um, kind of some of the compensation that's hidden these days. You know, pharmacy is being one of those yeah. uh, areas. And so I share your optimism. I think this is one component of a lot of components that need to change. And I was telling you off camera earlier, I feel like this there is a little bit of a revolution going yeah. on. Um, my friend Chris Hamilton calls it a renaissance, but yeah. I think we are going through a renaissance in healthcare. And it's fun to feel like you're sort of on the, the front lines of that. So thanks for traveling down. I'm sure we'll do another one of these soon. And like I said, I'll be up in Colorado in two weeks. So maybe we'll, we'll grab lunch or something while I'm there. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Bye.